has been said that more than the Jewish people have kept the Shabbos, the Shabbos has kept the Jewish people. A nice pithy statement. What does it really mean? Or does, is it even true? I don't know who said it, but it has been said. And it seems to be somebody important may have said it. What exactly does it mean that Shabbat has kept the Jewish people more than the Jewish people have kept the Shabbos? Many people see Shabbos, I'll, I like to use the Ashkenazi trans, uh, pronunciation, I'm used to growing up, it's all the same, you could say Shabbat, you could say Shabbos, you can, whatever you like, but I'm just going to go with Shabbos, it makes it easier for me. Some people see Shabbos as a day of rest, which it certainly can be, although I wonder, the people who say that may not have kids, because I can't get any rest at all with my kids on Shabbos somehow. I have this tradition in my family, after the Shabbat meal, in the afternoon, I tell my family, I'm sorry, but I just have to go upstairs and have a meeting with the pillow Rebbe. And sometimes the blanket or Rebbe comes as well. But um, day of rest, whoever heard of rest on Shabbos when you have a bunch of kids? But it certainly can be that for some people, a day of rest. However, and don't get me wrong, we, we certainly need rest. But that's not what Shabbat is, and we're going to prove that. One reason why I think we do need rest is a brilliant, paragraph, brilliant um, line or paragraph that's written, some say by George Carlin. The paradox of our time in history is that we have taller buildings but shorter tempers. Wider freeways, but narrower viewpoints. We spend more, but have less. We buy more, but enjoy it less. We have bigger houses and smaller families. More, com- more conveniences, but less time. We have more degrees, but less sense. More knowledge, but less judgment. More experts, but more problems. More medicine, but less wellness. We drink too much, smoke too much, spend too recklessly, laugh too little, drive too fast, get too angry too quickly, stay up too late, get up too tired, read too seldom, watch TV too much, and pray too seldom. We have multiplied our possessions, but reduced our values. We talk too much, I know I do. We love too too seldom and hate too often. We've learned how to make a living, but not a life. We've added years to life, not life to years. That last line, we've added years to our lives. We're living longer than they used to, but somehow we haven't added life to those years. So there's no question we certainly need a day of rest, more than once a week. I'll take it once every three days. But that cannot be all about what Shabbat is. Shabbat is so much more than that, and I can prove it to you. We know that Shabbat is central to Judaism. It is the only ritual that is mentioned in the Ten Commandments, in the Sarat Adibrot. It could have been Yom Kippur could have been in there, which is pretty big. Yom Kippur is not in there. Kosher, not in there. Of Passover, not in there. Of the Ten Commandments, the only one, only ritual that's in there is keeping Shabbat. That's pretty big. More than that, the mitzvah of Shabbat, the commandment of Shabbat, is mentioned more times in the Torah than any other mitzvah. must be very central. In fact, more than just being essential to Judaism, it actually defines a Jew. For many, many, many thousands of years, and some, for centuries and millennia, Jews were never classified by, by various um, labels we have today. We're Orthodox, conservative, reformer, constructionist, no such thing. We never had labels like that. Our label was, you were either Shomer Shabbat, you reserved the Sabbath, you tried at least as much as you could, or you didn't observe the Shabbos. The Shabbos was considered the hallmark, the benchmark that defined the Jewish people. It's critical, it's central to Judaism. If it's just a day of rest, that can't be all there is. But if you're not tired, there goes the whole Shabbat. Obviously, it's much more than that. And tonight we're going to discuss and try to explore what is it then if it's more than just a day of rest. But there's another reason why it can't be just a day of rest. <clears throat> We know there are a lot of rules about Shabbat, and that's what a lot of people have a problem with, that uh, there are many, many different rules, more so for Shabbat than any other mitzvah in the Torah. There are more complex rules about what you can and can do on Shabbat than any other commandment in the Bible. In fact, we know there are 39 creative activities which are forbidden biblically on Shabbat, among them, for example, cooking and planting and carrying in certain places on Shabbat without an Eru, without certain uh, leniencies and so on and so forth. 39 creative activities are forbidden, and the rabbi said, you know what, that's not enough, let's add another three or 4,000. I'm joking. But there are a lot of different complex laws, a lot of different rules about Shabbat. And one of the rules, for example, and people think about these rules, oh, well, Shabbat is about a day of rest, so any hard work would be forbidden, and probably these 39 activities are all difficult to do, but it's not true. A person is not supposed to cook on Shabbat. What if you love cooking? What if it comes easy to you? You're a brilliant chef, you're a gourmet cook. And you can just you know, turn on a fire and put some eggs in there and make a beautiful omelet. That's considered to be a, a violation of one of the rules of Shabbat, of cooking on Shabbat. And yet, at the same time, it doesn't seem to involve any major hard work. So why is that a problem if it's just a day of rest? My day of rest includes doing things which make me restful, like cooking. 
What if I like to go out into the backyard and just leisurely hold that little, you know, the, the little hose and you cover it to make the water come out in a spout? Watering a plant, you love it, it's so restful for me. And yet again, that's one of the activities which is forbidden on Shabbat. So clearly, if it's just a day of rest, then the rules don't add up either. We have to understand what are these rules all about which seem to defy our understanding of what Shabbat should be. If it's a day of rest, well, I enjoy, frankly, driving to the mall and, you know, looking at all the different things, schmoozing up the Israelis at the kiosks. You know, that's what I enjoy, so that's my rest. But clearly, Shabbat is much more than just a day of rest. What exactly is Shabbat? And why is it so central to Judaism? Why is it the only ritual in the Ten Commandments? Why is it the most commonly mentioned mitzvah in the Torah? And most importantly, how has it kept the Jewish people? If it's just a day of rest, it wouldn't answer that question too well. So let me share with you something that Rabbi Ari Kaplan writes in a wonderful book called Shabbat Day of Eternity. What exactly Shabbat is? To answer these questions, we have to go back to the fundamental beliefs of Judaism. Shabbat is much more than just a day of rest. It talks to the very essence of Judaism, to our belief system, in an amazing way. <clears throat> we Jews define God as the creator of all things and the one who brought all things into existence. As it says in the very first verse in the Torah, in the Bible, in the beginning God created heaven and earth. Some people think, they call them, some call them the creationists, they think God created the world for sure because after all, how did we just randomly show up out of nowhere? Must have been a creator who created us, but then God took off and is no longer involved in the world. Some people believe that. God created the world and forgot about it. They may claim to believe in God and even admit that there is some abstract creator out there, maybe golfing up in heaven somewhere. But they insist at the same time that his existence has no bearing on their lives because God is not intimately involved in our lives, maybe doesn't care about our lives, is not interested, whatever. But God started everything off, created the world, and took off. That's what some people believe. We know when God introduced himself to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai, he says, Anochi Hashem Lokech, I am the Lord your God, Mitzrayim, who took you out of the land of Egypt. God could have really impressed us more if he wanted to. God could have said, I am the Lord your God, who created you and could kill you if you don't follow me. Right? That's Bill Cosby used to say. He tells his kids, I don't know how to quote Bill Cosby anymore, but it used to be. B.C., Bill Cosby. Um, he used to tell his kids, he said, if you don't behave, I'll, I'll take you out of the world and make another one look just like you. So God could have said the same to us as well. He could have said to us, I am the Lord your God who created everything in this whole world, including you. And if you don't listen to me and don't do these Ten Commandments or 613 Commandments, whatever the case may be, I'll take you out and make another one just like you. But God doesn't do that. God introduces himself and says, I'm the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. Which means that I didn't just create the world billions of years ago or 6,000, whatever it is, years ago and take off. I'm intimately involved in the affairs of, your, of you and the rest of the world. I actually came down from a heavenly abode and shook up Egypt with ten mass, massive plagues. I took you out of Egypt. Somebody did this with major plagues, which you yourselves witnessed. So clearly we believe that God not only created the world, but also God is actively involved in this world. That is a basic belief of Judaism. These two beliefs, that one, God is a creator of all things, and that he created man with purpose, are the very foundation of our faith. Our ultimate role and mission as Jews is to be a light unto the nations, to proclaim these beliefs to the world, that the world has meaning, because a creator, a purposeful creator, created us, and therefore did it for a purpose. God didn't do it by mistake, because God is God. He created us for a purpose, and is actually involved and interested in our lives. And that's what we proclaim to the world. That's our, our way of giving, bringing a, a light to the nations. But unfortunately, that doesn't always work because the person may have a lot of faith, intellectual faith. That might be what's what we call emunah. Emunah means faith, but it's all intellectual, and it may stay up here. But that doesn't translate well. First of all, it doesn't transfer to the next generation. You might feel very strongly about the state of Israel, for example, but your kids might not feel that way about Israel. But a person who crafts their emunah, their faith, into something tangible, that's a whole different story. Rabbi Kaplan points out that the word in Hebrew for faith is emunah, the same word for a craftsman. Uman, an Uman is a craftsman. It's not enough just to have faith up here, but to make it something tangible is to, to actually make a ritual in which I live and act out what I believe. And therefore, that's what the idea of Shabbat is, because faith requires more than lip service. It must involve action in the form of our steadfast adherence to God's will. And the one ritual that we do that demonstrates, not just in our intellectual believing it, but actually living it and acting it out once every seven days, the one ritual that demonstrates our belief in God as a purposeful creator and therefore that the world has purpose is the observance of Shabbat. Shabbat is so central to the Jewish people because it's a statement of faith that Jewish people always make to say, why are we here? 
What's our purpose? Our purpose is to proclaim to the world that the world has meaning and has purpose. And it's very important because it can change our lives drastically to the extent that we believe that we have meaning and purpose in our lives. For the Jew, belief in God is more than a mere creed. It's the basis of all meaning in life. For if the world does not have a creator, then what possible meaning can there be in existence? If there's no purpose, then we're purposeless, meaningless. Man becomes nothing more than a complex physiochemical process, no more important than an ant or a grain of sand. Morality becomes a matter of convention. It's made up. Might makes right. It's the belief in God that gives life purpose and meaning. It's also what gives us a standard of right and wrong. If we know God created the world and did so for a purpose, then we also know that everything that runs counter to that purpose is morally reprehensible and wrong. And everything which runs furthers the purpose is good. That's why Shabbos, Sabbath, is so central to our faith, because it touch, touches on the cornerstone of what we are and what our purpose is as a nation. To believe in and to shout out to the world the idea that we were created for a purpose, by a purposeful creator, who has a purpose for our existence and a meaning to our lives. That's such a powerful idea. It's a difference between having a meaningless life, where everything is just random, and ultimately, who really cares about me if I die in a minute from now makes no difference to anybody, really? Or believe that I have ultimate meaning and purpose in my life. The Jew believes this in emunah and has that faith intellectually and also translates into ritual because it's not enough just to have that in here but also to craft your faith into something tangible which has much more power, certainly has staying power for the next generation because they see you doing it instead of just thinking, hey, I think my dad likes Israel or believes in God. I might just pick that up one day. Not good enough. To live it out and to work it through every single day, every single Shabbos, every single week, to live out that ritual, that is very, very powerful. And it, trans and it stays, and it translates very well to the next generation. So Shabbat is much more than a day of rest, as we see. Shabbat is a day of proclaiming our faith, both in intellectually, in our, in our emunah, and also in our action, how we believe in this most central idea of Judaism, the most powerful idea of Judaism, which is that we believe that we have a purpose to our existence. And that's why Jews, we'll save it till afterwards, that's why Jews are called Shomer Shabbat, because the Shomer Shabbat means that a person believes in this one central idea, everything else follows from there. If you don't have that idea, if we're missing that idea, then we're falling short in everything else we do because what's, there's no context. The Shabbat is what gives context to everything that we do. There's a beautiful idea, oh, that's quick, beautiful idea which I once read in the name of the Chavetz Chaim. Chavetz Chaim asked the following question. He says, we know that the Torah refers to, thank you so much, the Torah refers to Shabbat as an oath, as a sign. Why does it mean that Shabbat is a sign? Certainly, it's a sign if you keep Shabbat. It's a sign that you're Jewish. But so if you keep kosher, it's also a sign that you're Jewish. But why is Shabbat specifically referred to as a sign? So the Chavetz Chaim says a fascinating thing. He says, for example, what about a person, you have a friend who has a shoe store downtown, for example. Joe's Shoes. Okay, so you're strolling downtown one day, and you see Joe's Shoes has a big sign up there. So you know, oh, it's Joe's Shoes. He must be in business. But you look through the window, and you see there's barely no shoes on the, on, the, on the display racks. There's nothing there. His stock is depleted. So you say to yourself, one second, Joe doesn't look like he has any stock. But his sign is still up. That means he's still in business. You come back two weeks later, and you see that Joe's sign is down. He's no longer in business because the sign is down. Says the Chavetz Chaim, and it's very powerful what he says. He says, Shabbat is that oath, that sign. That sign between us and God that we believe in the purpose for our existence, that we have purpose for our existence. That life isn't meaningless. As long as the Jew has that sign up and keeps to that in their emunah, in their intellectual faith, as well as in their crafting that faith into a ritual every, every seven days, as long as we have that, that sign up, that means we're in business. We're doing what we're meant to do as Jews. That's our business as Jews, is to proclaim this to ourselves and to the world. Then we're in business. We may not do that much else Jewishly, possibly. We might have our stock depleted. We don't have that much stock on the shelves. That could be. But at the same time, we're still in business because as long as the Jew believes in this fundamental idea of Judaism, this major cornerstone of our faith, that we have a purpose for our existence because we're created by a purposeful creator, then we're in business. But if a person no longer believes that, their sign is down, then they're, God forbid, out of business. That's how powerful Shabbat is among all the other commandments. It's what defines us. It's what defines the Jew throughout the centuries. It's the most central idea in Judaism, and we live it every single uh, week, for, uh, once every seven days. This translates, hopefully, to our children as well when they see the ritual that we live. But there's more. But wait, there's more. 
We want to understand the rules of Shabbat. We mentioned already that Shabbat is more than just a day of rest. That's clear. But what are all these rules and how do they fit into this idea of Shabbat being essentially a day when you're not supposed to do that much, not to work too much, and yet the rules seem to run counter to that idea. We mentioned one of the rules, for example, there's a person not supposed to water their plants on Shabbat. Biblically forbidden to water your plants on Shabbat. Some people find it the most beautiful, leisurely thing in the world to go out in the backyard on Saturday or Sunday or whatever and water their plants. It doesn't cause them any effort. They don't sweat at all. And, and yet, somehow, this is somehow defying the, the nature of Shabbat. Or another example, we mentioned before, cooking. Take an egg, crack it open, put, take some salt, a little oil, add some cheese, make a nice little cheese omelet there. You have made, you've created something, you've cooked something, besides the fire that you turned on, which is another one of the forbidden activities. But you've cooked something. It was leisurely, it was something that didn't take me any, it was no effort whatsoever. I loved it. It gives me such great joy to cook omelets. I love it. And yet again, we can't do that. We have to come to a working definition of what Shabbat is. Where's the paper here? Are you allowed to? You allowed to? 100%. There are, but there are some exceptions. Depends when, but let's not go to... Is there an extra handout? So you look at number five. We're going to discuss now what, what rest really is, what Shabbat rest really is all about. But before we get to that, to that answer, we have to understand that what rest is because it will give us a, a better framework for appreciating what Shabbat is all about because for many people who don't appreciate this idea which we're about to share... And Shabbat becomes one big fat no. You can't do it, especially children. They hear, all they hear is no, no, no. You can't do this, you can't do that, and it turns them off. But the more that we appreciate and, and, and integrate into our own lives our understanding of what Shabbat is, and that it's not something negative, and that we can appreciate why the rules are the way they are and how they fit into the broader scheme of what Shabbat is, that will help us hopefully integrate into our own lives. And not look, we, we ourselves will look at Shabbat in a much more positive way, and then it'll translate, of course, to our children, our friends, our, our families. So we have to really appreciate. It's very important to appreciate and understand well what the rules are and why the rules are the way they are. Again, I go back to what Rabbi Kaplan says in the wonderful book, uh, Shabbat Day of Eternity. What does the Torah mean when it says that God rested? Because we know that we're resting because God rested on Shabbat. He said, we worked for six days and he rested on the seventh day. It sounds like God had a hard time. He was sweating. He really, you know, it was tough work in those first six days. And he said, I've got to take a break and I've got to get to the links and the golf course now. I just, it's too hard for me. But it, that's ridiculous. That's like a grade two understanding which we used to have. We, we always used to have this when we thought God was up there. Right? Where was God? Up there. He's not up there. God's everywhere, right? But that's the way we used to think about it. So we also think about God. God rested as if God somehow had this hard time. He had, a, oh, my hernia, you know, got to stop what we're creating now. He's got to go to sleep for the next 24 hours. Obviously, it's not what it means. So what does it mean? Was he tired? Did he work too hard? Was creation an exhausting task? Is the Torah so naive that it looks at God in such a way in human terms? God rested in another sense. What does it mean he rested? He rested when he stopped creating, when he no longer interfered with his world. Listen carefully to Rabbi Kaplan's beautiful definition, which I think is something you can really live with and, make, and reconcile our, our Shabbat experience and enhance it very much. God rested in a different sense. It wasn't that he was very, very tired. God forbid. God doesn't get tired. He rested when he stopped creating, when he no longer interfered with his world. This gives us an insight into Torah's definition of Sabbath rest. What it means is, when you rest in Shabbat, it doesn't mean you literally rest. It means you stop interfering with the world. We live in harmony with the world, just like God stopped creating and tampering with and interfering and changing, moving things around. And, well, Niagara Falls has to go to let, let the Canadians have most of it. You know, all that. After we stop, every seventh day, we stop interfering with the world. We, don't, we, we live with harmony within the world instead of trying to change it. And that's a good definition. Work, in a Shabbat sense, is an act that shows our mastery over the world by means of our intelligence and skill. Changing and manipulating, using our mastery and intelligence to try to change the world around us. That's what work is. That's the kind of work we're defining as work. And as we say in number six and number five in the hand, that rest, on the, on the other hand, in the Shabbos sense, is not interfering with nature, nor exhibiting mastery over it. It is a state of peace between man and nature. We now can understand a little bit better with this definition of what rest is in Shabbat, the, the Shabbos ritual. We must never leave nature, we must leave nature untouched. We must not demonstrate our mastery over nature nor change it in any way. Heavy work and physical labor such as plowing and building are still work in this sense, but it also includes other things which require no effort at all. For example, frying an egg, lighting a match. These may not require much effort, but they are symbols of man's dominance over nature. 
changing something, creating a new item, creating an omelet out of, out of raw materials, is ex exhibiting mastery over things, interfering, tampering, and changing things, not living in harmony with the world. The Sabbath is much more than a mere day of rest. It is a symbol of our belief in God's creation. That's a very powerful idea. You think about when Shabbat, I always tell my family, I say, it's not like I, before Shabbat, I open up this big list and say, okay, here guys, here are the 4,000 things you're forbidden to do for the next 25 hours. Come on guys, let's have Shabbat, yay. Obviously the kids would be running out of the house as fast as possible. But if you think about it in this way, it's so much more beautiful. When I drive down the street, when I, when I walk down the street on Shabbat and there are cars driving next to me, it almost, it almost because once, once I learned this idea, it sort of irked me because there are people who are trying to just tamper with nature and try to move things around and pollute. And on Shabbat, I want to live in harmony with the world because I have a lot more things to do, which we'll get to in a minute. I want to live in harmony. So what happens is we set for ourselves this beautiful framework of things that we don't do. So we know we're not going to cook on Shabbat. So we cook everything before Shabbat. Everything is ready pre-cooked and ready set up on your crock pot. It's all done beforehand. So we don't have to tamper with anything And once the Shabbat starts. And then once Shabbat starts, we're living within the framework of all these things you can't do. We don't think about them because we've already planned it. So it's not like you're sitting there on the Shabbos morning and man, I wish I could have cooked that chicken. You don't say that because you cooked the chicken the day before. You're all ready for it. You're, you're living in a framework where it's all done. It's all prepared. Of course, there are times when things don't work out exactly as planned. And when you do feel the, the big fat no, for example, what happens if a person, I'll give you an extreme example, but it certainly can happen. A person's driving somewhere before Shabbat and it gets closer and closer and closer to Shabbat and they can't make it. They seem they won't be able to make it to, to stop driving and to get to their house before Shabbat starts. So obviously, if it's a, it's a case of danger, you're allowed to drive to save your life. You're not obligated, I'm obligated to get killed for this. Of course, you drive away from the dangerous neighborhood. I grew up in New York City. It wouldn't, it would stop, it wouldn't stop in most neighborhoods. But I mean to say, when a person has the ability, to, for example, to stay at a mall or some other safe place or a hotel lobby for, uh, you know, for the next 25 hours, let's say they have food with themselves, for it. it's extreme. It doesn't normally happen. Somebody will say, well, come on, what kind of a Shabbat rest is that? That's very obvious that a person's, quote, so to speak, suffering because... But the answer to that is, as my late uncle, Rabbi Ozil Malevsky, once explained, the Torah talks to generalities. The Torah gives us laws for the general, normal situations. And the brilliance of it is that we keep it to it at all costs because once we start saying, well, in that case it's different, in that case it's different, that's the beginning of the end of the unraveling of the law. So we keep the law because most of the time the spirit of the law and the letter of the law coincide. They, they coalesce with each other. And most of the time a person's not stuck on the highway somewhere and therefore they don't have a problem with food because the food's already cooked before Shabbat. They don't have a problem with lights because lights are set on and off with timers all around the house with kosher lamp, whatever it is, paid for by kosher lamp. Right? So everything is set up. There's no problem for them. They're not living with this framework of no. That's what we have to appreciate. Shabbat is that time when a person can live in harmony with nature. I've set everything up. I have time now to set aside 25 hours to spend with my family, to spend time spiritually still growing and so on, as we get to in a minute. What are the positive sides of Shabbat? But the negatives are not felt if it's done right because a person just sets themselves up for 25 hours where everything is already done. There's no need to focus on the things you can't do except in rare occasions or exceptions. And therefore, a person can just live in harmony with creation. That's the idea of emulating God's rest in Shabbat. Just like Shabbat, God rested and did not interfere and no longer interfered with His creation and said, that's it, I'm going to live in harmony with my creation and not tamper with it. So too, we rest in Shabbat by not exhibiting our mastery over anything that we have. We leave things as they are for the next 25 hours and that's a beautiful harmony of what Shabbat is. This takes me to this idea about the exhibiting of peace, of mastery over nature, and not to interfere with Shabbat and living in harmony, this takes us to number six. We know Shabbat is called Shabbat Shalom. And a lot of people say, you know, which is Shabbat Shalom? Some say, good Shabbos. It's all good. Some say, Shabbat Satov. If you want to be fancy, you can say it in Aramaic. I think like Mel Gibson does, right? What does Shabbat Shalom mean? It's a Shabbos of peace. In what sense do we mean that the Shabbos is a Shabbos of peace? So Rabbi Becher says something very nice in his wonderful book, Gateway to Judaism. He says, there are three areas which potentially can cause conflict in people's lives during the work week. There is a tension between man and nature, especially when nature is disastrous and the weather is horrible, or in, in pollution or whatever else it might be. A lot, of, a lot of tension between man and nature. I would say cell phones, for example, is a, is a great area of conflict between man and nature. A person would want to have a nice time, an enjoyable time, enjoying the beautiful world that God gave us, but the technology out there, which is good technology, is still at the same time, it can certainly cause a conflict where a person has, doesn't have the ability to enjoy nature and it creates that wedge between me and the beautiful world around me because I don't see it. But that's one area of conflict between man and nature. And the second area of conflict is between man and man, our fellow man, our competitors especially. 
right? That's an area of tension. The, the shoe store across the street, they're making more money than man, they're more customers. So it's an area of tension. And finally, a third area of tension is between man and self, between my bodily needs and my soul needs. So part of me is pushing me to, to eat that chocolate cake and to, to, to do all types of things I shouldn't do. And there's a soul element to me, that to guilt, the, the guilty conscience, the good part of me that's saying I shouldn't do it. These are three areas which can cause a lack of peace, a great lack of peace throughout the week. But of course, Shabbat comes along. Shabbat Shalom, it's a Shabbat of peace. And it's a beautiful cure, it's a beautiful antidote to these three areas of tension. Number one, in terms of the ability to enjoy nature, not to have that conflict between man and nature. We shut off our cell phones, that's the greatest thing that the, I think the greatest byproduct of Shabbat is the idea that a person can actually have the power to shut off all technology and just like the phone can ring all day long I don't, I don't even hear it I don't have my television on I don't have uh, my, my cell phone nothing I'm just free to enjoy the world around me and to live in harmony with nature and not to have that interference at all which is a beautiful thing and that's what Shabbat creates it also creates a tremendous peace between man and man because you know you're not working anymore a person can sit back once every seven days and say you know what God I'll, I won't work today I'm not going to have that competition with that, my neighbor. I'm just going to chill out, enjoy Shabbat for what it is. And finally, in between man and, and, and himself, where a person's bodily needs and soul needs, they both taken care of in Shabbat, both of them. And that brings me to number six, number seven, actually. There's actually a rabbinical commandment to make sure that the conflict doesn't exist between body and soul. And that's a rabbinical commandment called Oneg Shabbat. Oneg means enjoyment, pleasure. Oneg Shabbat is a commandment. The rabbi said we should have ourselves Oneg on Shabbat, which means, number one, we should eat good food, food that gives us pleasure. I always say a vegetarian, if they don't get pleasure from meat, so they shouldn't eat meat. But somebody who gets pleasure from eating meat should eat meat. It's sort of subjective. But either way, anything that gives you pleasure and Oneg, you should eat. Um, of course, drinking as well, a good bottle of scotch, a single malt, or, or a can of Coke, whatever it is you might like. It also gives Oneg. He goes so far as to say that even the rabbi said if one can, one should have marital relations on Friday night with one's spouse, that also gives the person a certain oneg. It's all part of this, all this idea of having oneg, of having pleasure in Shabbat. But it's interesting, for some people, they don't see that. They don't see the oneg part of it. They see it as something which is, oh no, not another Shabbat of restrictions. There's two ways to look at Shabbat. There's two ways to look at everything in the world, but certainly Shabbat. You can see it as oneg, it's a pleasure, or you can see it as a nega, which is the same word as an, as an anagram. The word nega is the Hebrew word for it's a plague. I can see this as a plague, something which is really a hindrance, I can't stand this, it's this restrictive Shabbat thing. Or you can see it as the biggest pleasure in the world because it releases all these tensions and areas of conflict. You know the difference between oneg pleasure and the Hebrew word for nega plague? Depends where you place the ayin in that word. Right? If you look at the word oneg in number seven, oneg is spelled ayin nun gimel, I don't have it in Hebrew here. Ayin is first in the word oneg. If you place the word ayin, the letter ayin, in the end of it, it becomes nega. Ayin also means I. The person it depends where you place your eye, how you view it. You can see the next 25 hours of Shabbat as the greatest oneg, the greatest pleasure possible. But if you want to see it that way, you can see it that way. Also, if you place your eye in a different place, you put your eye in, in a different part of the word, you can see it as one big, long, fact string of no, you can't do this, no, you can't do that, restriction, and restriction, restriction, plague, and, then, and so on and so forth. But the idea of Shabbat is supposed to bring us the rabbis want to ensure that it happens, bring us this beautiful harmony between body and soul, and therefore they said they didn't trust us to do it ourselves. They said, make sure you enjoy yourself in Shabbat, so that not just your soul should be calmed by Shabbat and enjoying Shabbat, but your body should also be fed well and also drinking properly, enjoying himself. It's very important. Sorry? Too much is no good. Right? Too much of anything is no good, right? It's an interesting idea that Baal Shem Tov once explained. He said, Why, what's the idea of, of Onik Shabbat? Because it seems to be it's a little bit counter to the holiness of Shabbat. Shabbat's a holy time, yet there's this big, I don't know in your family, but in my family, there's a big focus on food. I, mean, I think of all Jewish families, and Italian families too. But there's a big focus on food, and maybe a little too much, certainly in my family. And I always wonder, is this exactly the most spiritual thing in the world? There's a lot of, where does it come from, this whole idea of eating? I know it's a rabbinical commandment, but how does it work? So I once heard a beautiful idea in the name of the Baal Shem Tov. He said like this, he said, once upon a time there was this fellow who was thrown into jail, wrongfully thrown into jail. And he missed his wife and children terribly, but he had no, no way to get to speak to them. But she, his wife used to send him every single week, she used to send him on Friday, a letter. And he wanted to sit down and read that letter, because he missed his wife terribly. Problem is, every time he sat down in the corner to open up the letter, he would get uh, roughed up by some of those tough guys in jail. They try to beat him up like it typically happens in jail. He couldn't do anything. So he had this brilliant idea. He said, I'm going to write a letter to my wife and have her bake a cake for me. Inside the cake, I wanted to buy the, and put in the best 
single malt scotch you could, or vodka you could find, hide it inside this pudding or cake, pudding cake, whatever cake it is, and bring it to me. So she does that. She brings him the cake. He takes it into his cell, feels, you know, in the middle of it, pulls out the vodka or it's not scotch, whatever it is. He says, okay, hey, guess what, everyone? Here's, here's some scotch. And they go, ooh. And they start drinking until they're all flat on their backs, you know, and they're snoring and, you know, content and all drunk. Now when they're all drunk and everything's quiet, he can take out all those love, love letters and reconnect with the love of his life that he's been missing for so many years. Says the Holy Baal Shem Tov, that's exactly what we're all about. Every Shabbat, we want to reconnect. Take out the, that love letter, which is the Torah, the Bible that God gave us, the ultimate love letter where God says, I love you and I want you to have a maximum meaning in your life. And here's this love letter. And we want to enjoy it, but that stomach of ours, that ruffian, says, give me food, give me food, give me drink, give me this, give me coke, give me... So we say, okay, we give them cake, we give them food, we give the stomach whatever it needs until the stomach is happy, it has all the oneg and pleasure that it can want, and then you go, ah, oh, now I could sit back, I could sing Zmiros and these beautiful songs and reconnect with God, reconnect with my family, and so on. That's the oneg of Shabbat, that's what it's all about, and that's why we have Shabbat Shalom, it's the time of Shalom. Why is it Shalom? Because it brings peace, peace between man and his environment, peace between man and his competitors and other people, and peace between man and himself and his bodily needs. It's a tremendous peace that Shabbat provides as well. So again, just to sum up now, we have so far we've said Shabbat, of course, is more than a day of rest, not that we don't need rest. We have a hard time in our days creating rest, but we certainly, it's much more than that. It's a cornerstone of our faith. It's, it's living this idea in practice, in ritual, crafting our faith into a practical ritual which has staying power through the generations. Living this idea that by the way we to be emulate God by resting on the seventh day, this idea, the powerful idea of Judaism that God created us, purposeful created for a purpose, that we have meaning to our lives. And the rules of Shabbat also, again, fit in very well because the rules are about not tampering with the world. God rested on the seventh day. He didn't interfere with creation. We live in harmony with creation every seven days. But there's another element to Shabbat, and it's with everything in Judaism as well, as we'll see in the next couple of classes. There are so many different layers upon layers. There's never one just, okay, here's the idea of Shabbat in 20 minutes, and here, there's no such thing. There's layers upon layers. Here's another layer of Shabbat. Shabbat is the time to return, to return to ourselves, to return to Judaism, to return to ourselves. Look at the root of the word Shabbat. The root of the word Shabbat is Shin Bet, which means shove, to return. The Maharal of Prague says a fascinating thing. He says, you look at a person's life as if his life is represented by a, the Aleph Bet, starting from Aleph, the beginning of a person's life, till Tuf, the end of a person's life. The Aleph represents the beginning of one's life because Aleph, for many reasons, number one, Aleph, well, it's the first letter, obviously. Aleph is an Aluf. Aluf is a general, is a guide. It represents our Neshama, our soul, our spiritual soul, which is our inner guide, our Seichel, our intellect. Aleph is also a silent letter, just like a very, very, um, spirituality is very intangible and silent. Many people don't even know if they even have a soul or a spiritual side. It's very silent. The Aleph is always, almost always a silent letter. For example, you're sitting right now on a, in Hebrew, a ki, kise. That's what it's called. A chair is called a kise. If you took the last letter, the Aleph, away from that word, you wouldn't fall off the chair. Right? It would still be kise without the Aleph. Aleph is a silent letter. So to our neshama, our spiritual side is also silent. So everyone starts off in this world with an Aleph, the beautiful in the Shama, which uh, their soul, which is granted silent and somewhat hiding, but there for sure to guide us in life, if we can uh, tap into it to guide us. What happens in life? We start moving, we go to the next letter, Bet, Bez, whatever we pronounce it, and Bet represents the idea of making a bayat, or bonet, building. We build our lives, we start from the, we, our core, and hopefully we build our lives with the decisions that we make, the free will decisions, and so on, until we get to the last letter, which is tough, which represents death, First of all, it's the last letter. That's why it's death. That's at the end. Plus, also, I like to say when you die, it's tough, right? Anyway, but before, once you're already at the tough, it's too late. If you're still at the shin, it means you haven't yet reached the end yet. You still have time. You're still alive. Then you can go from shin and be shove, return, shin all the way back to bet. Shin, bet. All the way, as long as your aleph, your core, is still intact, as long as your aleph, you haven't corrupted your, your... Some people are so wicked, they corrupt their aleph. There's nothing left to go back to. They've corrupted their core. But for all of us, it's not like that. We just may have made some mistakes, some layers, but the inner layer is pure. As long as the inner layer is pure, the olive, you can go back to, you can be shove. That's why the word shove is the root for the word return, because it's shin, the letter shin, before you're dead, and then you have too, it's too late. Shin, all the way back to bed, to return. Shabbat is a time to return to who we are. It's a very powerful idea. I once heard, I actually said this on Shabbat at the village shul, my, grand, my late uncle, Rabbi Mazil Malevsky, that's all, shared a beautiful idea about Havdalah. What Abdullah is all about. We know that after Shabbat, we have a beautiful ritual, and part of the ritual involves looking at our fingernails. 
Everyone, know, everyone knows about this. We, we look at our fingernails. Now the question is, why are we looking at our fingernails on Shabbat, Moshe Shabbat, after it's over, we're making Abdullah. And one of the main halachic reasons is because you're not supposed to make a blessing on something unless you actually partake of it, either eat it or enjoy it in some way. Otherwise, you're disconnected from it. So if you have a fire that's, you know, in Japan, and you're not going to be enjoying it, so you can't make a bracha, a blessing on it. You have to be close enough in proximity to the fire to be able to benefit in some way from its light. So therefore, we hold our, our hands up like this to see if we can differentiate by the light of the candle if we're close enough to differentiate between the nail and the, and the skin because they're not the same. If you're close enough that you can see the difference between the nail and the skin, then you've benefited, you're, you're enough close to benefit from the candle and you, your blessing is okay. That's the technical, halachic, ritualistic reason, one of them at least, why we do this. But Rabbi Malevsky shared a beautiful idea about the, the concept of Shabbat being a time to get clarity. Rabbi Malevsky said as follows. We have a beautiful tradition that Adam and Eve, before they sinned in the Garden of Eden and partook of this forbidden fruit and caused all this distortion in the world, that they were entirely covered, their entire bodies were covered, they didn't have clothing on, but they were entirely covered with a nail-like substance. After they partook for the forbidden fruit, then the nail-like substance receded from the bodies and was only left on their fingernails and toenails. And that's the official reason, the Jewish traditional reason why we have nails, and though evolutionists will say something else, I'm sure, this is the official reason why the Judaism believes why we have the nail left over here, because God said, he took it all away from you by leaving it over here. What does this mean? Says Rabbi Malevsky. What does nail represent? You go to a nail salon, you sit there, and someone's cutting your nails and you're not screaming. They're cutting you! Why aren't you jumping up and down in pain, in agony? But then the answer, of course, is that they're cutting something which is on you, but it's not you. You have this clarity about the nail. Oh, it's just on top of me, but it's not really me. Try cutting my finger off and I'll sue. I'm American, we sue for everything. Right? So, but obviously then you feel it, but if it's a nail, nail represents something which is on me, yet it's not me. Adam and Eve, before they, took this, before they created this distortion by partaking of the forbidden fruit, they had such clarity who they were. They knew they weren't just the physical body. They were the soul. They had clarity about who they were to the point that the whole body was covered by nail, meaning either metaphorically or real, whatever, we're not clear. But that means that they had a clarity about their skin that it was like nail, meaning that it covered them, and yet it wasn't them. Their bodies just covered who they really were. They had that nail-like clarity they got. But of course, once they took for the forbidden fruit, they lost that clarity, and God did us a favor and allowed for them to have a little bit of a re reminder of that clarity by leaving a little bit of a remnant of that on the ends of our fingers and toenails. When do, we, when do we have a chance to regain a little bit of that clarity about what's important? When, we have a, when do we have a chance to return to ourselves? When we push away everything else and we have no more conflicts and we have peace and harmony with creation, we have no pressure from the cell phone or from trying to tamper with creation. When do we have that time to get some clarity as to what's important in life, what our priorities should be? Who, what, and Shabbat, that's, a, that's when we have that time. That's what Shabbat's all about. It's a time to get that clarity, to be shoved, to return to ourselves, to realize what's important in the world instead of just work, 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 work. Stop for a second. Think about what's important in life. And the problem is, though, we're going back again. It only lasts 24 hours, unfortunately. Sadly, we start losing that clarity as we're going back into the work week, especially in Israel where they work all six days a week. Well, that's true. That's exactly what you do. You look at your fingernails, and you say to yourself, this clarity that I once had over the last 25 hours, I'm going to bring this back with me into the week. That's why you look at your nails. So take one last look at your nails and say, one second, the nail... That's what my whole body used to be like because this is not just me. And I'm going to go to the gym and work, my, work out tomorrow night, Sunday night maybe, but I'm also going to go to a Torah class and work out my spiritual soul too. You get that clarity in Shabbat. That's another aspect, another layer of Shabbat as well. It's a time to return to ourselves and a time to get the clarity about who we truly are. I want to share with you, and we'll tell for questions after we finish. I want to share with you, before we get our book recommendations, Another beautiful idea, which again talks to the idea of what Shabbat's all about, another layer. There was a story about a great rabbi, Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zonnenfeld. He was the chief rabbi of Israel in the 20s and 30s, in the early years of what's called the old Yishuv, the old population of Jews living in Jerusalem. Very, very, very precious Jew. Just one of the stories to tell about him, which is interesting for today, that he was going to meet with the head of the British High Command, I forget his name, and they, the, the apartment that Rabbi Zanifel lived in, in the old city of Jerusalem, I think in Rehov Batim Achsa, which is still there, was a hole in the wall, literally a hole in the wall. It was a cave of some sort. And he was the chief rabbi, remember. This is how he lived. And, and he had to also bend down a lot because a lot of it was very low. He kept on hitting his head. And he was now going to entertain 
the chief high lord, high commissioner, Herbert, I forget his name exactly, whoever it was, entertain him in this hovel. And all of the rabbi's students said, please, rabbi, you can't do this. You can't, you can't bring him in here. It's embarrassing for the entire city of Jerusalem, for the Jewish people. He said, I'm sorry, but I have to. And the commissioner comes in with him and starts asking him, Rabbi, they don't give you a decent salary here? Like, you know, you're living in this dump? But he says to the commissioner, come with me. He shows him there's a, one of the windows that looks out onto, onto the Harabai, the Temple Mount. And you see, he said, you see over there? God's house used to be there, and it was a beautiful house. And then it was destroyed. I can't, build, I can't bring myself to build myself this beautiful mansion when God's house is still is in shambles. That was the sensitivity that this great rabbi had. But there's a story that's told about one night, one Friday night when his wife was sick and he, um, he asked the, the next door neighbor who was this, uh, a non-observant, non-Torah observant Jew if he would be able to come, it was a doctor, and come, to bring, come over with the lantern and to help, him, uh, to, to help him heal his wife. And he came over, of course, and we, we know the Allah of the Jewish law says that whenever it's a case of endangerment of life, then of course all the laws of Shabbat fall by the wayside, so of course you, t- you do whatever you have to do. Sorry? Exactly, pikuach nefesh is the Hebrew word for it, thank you. Pikuach nefesh means a case of danger, so here is a case of danger, and he called the doctor and he lit a lantern, fine. As they're walking back to the doctor's house, and he thanks the doctor profusely, he thought it would be a good time to impress upon him one of the ideas, one of the layers and themes of what Shabbat observance is all about. He said the following, he said, imagine if you were to create a picture of a human being, an art- artistic rendering of a human being, and you had to do it proportionally to size. What do you think would be the ratio in height, not in weight, not in volume, but in height, of the average person's head to the rest of their body. In other words, not like a baby. Baby's like it's all head and a little bit of body, right? But most people, normal people, they have a certain ratio. There's an average standard. I looked it up later on to see if it's actually true. There's a standard ratio. One, two. So it's actually Greek. I saw Greek drawings online. Google must be right if it's Google. Um, it said one, one to seven. In other words, seven of these would make up a person. One plus six more be the average person. Okay, what's the point of all this? Where are we going with all this? So Rabbi Zunderfeld said to the doctor, he said, well, once upon a time, all the limbs and, and, uh, and uh, the limbs of the body and organs ganged up on the head. And they said, hey, head, this isn't fair. This is really, uh, you know, it, it, it's just unfair because we, get to, we have to do all the schlepping, all the schlepping around and carrying heavy things. You get to do all the good stuff. You get to have all the good food and the drink and the schmooze, all the great schmoozing. It's just not fair. So the head, the head says to the rest of the body, of course that's fair, of course I deserve more than you. Who do you think plans out your actions and makes them meaningful? If it weren't for me planning it out and prioritizing, and giving meaning and choice and thinking in advance of what you're doing, then there would be no point to what you're doing. You'd just be running around like a, literally with, like a chicken without a head. So the doctor was a very smart man. The doctor says, oh, I get it, Rabbi. Shabbat is also that one-seventh of the week. It's the head of the week. It's that one day of the week when a person stops from what they're doing and gives meaning and prioritize their life in such a way that they, that they don't just go on. Because sometimes a person goes on, you know, the same idea you find, by the way, for Rosh Hashanah as well. Rosh Hashanah is called the head of the year, right? Rosh Hashanah. That's a very strange way to refer to the new year. We should call it Shana Chadasha, Happy New Year. We don't do that. We say, happy head of the year, Rosh Hashanah. Why is it the head of the year? Why is it, the, if anything, it should be the beginning of the year? Because the head represents the idea that a person doesn't just go through year after year after year, but they stop and they plan with that head of theirs what, what I'm going to do next year, what I should do different from last year, what I should continue. Shabbat's the same thing as well. Shabbat is that one seventh. It's the head of the week, that time of the year, of the week, I should say, when we plan out and make all our choices meaningful. I have a friend, Rabbi Mordechai Ryan, who wrote a wonderful book, which I'm not sure if it's available anymore, but you can check it out online. In addition to the two recommendations here, number 10, it's called The Magic of Shabbos. And in there he has a beautiful story, which I'll finish with, which we'll tie it all together. The story is told about this fellow, He's, working in the, uh, he's a salesman working in the deep south, somewhere in Texas. It's Friday afternoon. Now, he always carries with him, and it's always a good idea if you have to travel late right before Shabbat, although it's not a good idea to travel before Shabbat. It's one of the halachot, the Jewish laws, not to do that, but a person has to tra- travel for whatever reason, should always bring a little Shabbat kit. So he had a little Shabbat kit. The kit had in it candles to light, and which is not just for women, it's for men as well. Again, I don't have a chance to discuss the myriad laws of Shabbat tonight in the limited time that we have. But Shabbat candles are primarily done by the woman of the house, but if if the man's alone, he lights candles himself. So this fellow, this salesman in the deep south, he carried with him a Shabbat kit. It had two candles. It had the the, uh, Kiddush cup and the little Kedem grape juice bottle. He had himself two chali rolls, of course. 
and then he had the he even had the gefilte fish with the horseradish in a little you know closed cup and the carrot on top. He had to have. I took my kids once to PJ's Pet Store, which I think is no longer there, and we looked at a fish. We wanted to buy it. And it was a fish. It was a white-looking fish, which had right over here on top had an orange thing. My kids said, "Gefilte." We bought it right away. It was fantastic. So he had this whole kit. Fine. So he's looking for a place to stop, and it's, he's, no, he's nowhere anything. He's nowhere any a place to stop. No house, no hotel, nothing. He's coming closer and closer to Shabbos. Finally, it's getting really dark. It's almost shiki. It's almost sunset. He says, the next place, next house, next structure I see, I'm pulling in, I'm staying there no matter what. Turns out the place he stops at is a county jail. Okay, gets out of his car with his kit, rushes into the county jail. He says, listen, I'm, I'm a Shabbos observant Jew and I, I, I can't drive anymore. Is it okay if I leave my car here in the parking lot? I'll stay in the lobby, I'll pay you. Just let me stay in your lobby for the next 25 hours. So this, the warden says, you don't have to pay me or anything for you. You can leave your car wherever you want, but you just can't stay in the lobby. You've got to keep the lobby clean. You, if you want, you can stay in one of the cells. Having no choice, he gets into one of the cells. There are other people there, hardened criminals. He gets into a corner, hides himself into a corner, and he, uh, and he pulls him, he sits down, and he pulls out the two candlesticks, puts them on the floor, makes a blessing, and then he pulls out his grape juice. And then the inevitable happens. He gets a tap on his shoulder. Hey, you. So he looks back, and it's one of these hardened criminals, and the guy says to him, What are you in for? I think that's how they say it in Texas, by the way. I lived in, in Atlanta, Georgia, four years. So I'm pretty close. What are you in for? So he says, Shabbos. That's a strange thing to say. And then the, then the guy says, Shabbos? And what do you get for it? And he says, life. Shabbos is truly a way to get a life for Jew, Jew, Jewish people. It is what kept the Jewish people for so long. Why did it keep us so just to tie it all together? Why did Shabbat keep the Jewish people more than the Jewish people kept Shabbat? Because if you have something to live for, if you believe that your life has ultimate meaning and purpose, because you believe in a purposeful creator who created you with intention to, keep, to be involved in the affairs of your life and to care about you, if you believe in that and not just believe in it, but act it out and live it and, and craft your amuna, your actual live it with making it into a ritual which has staying power, then no matter how difficult things can get for the Jewish people, and God, and God forbid, nothing should ever happen, but all through the centuries and millennia of persecution, Jewish people always had that Shabbos. We're always never more than seven or six days away from another Shabbos, which reminded us that everything has ultimate meaning and purpose, and nothing's random, nothing's coincidental. Everything has ultimate meaning to it, and that gave us the power and the ability to go on and to keep the Jewish people. So my blessing to all of us is we should get a life, that we should be able to, to always enjoy and have an enhanced experience of our Shabbat, and again, the more we learn about it, I recommend these two books here, especially Shabbat Day of Eternity and, and the Gateway to Judaism. These are excellent books which give us more understanding, especially covering all the laws of Shabbat that we didn't discuss this evening. 